Right, my name is Landon Gilfillan with Pepper and Pine Garden Design, and today we have the pleasure of having our awesome friends, the Strathlings, out with us. This Hi. is Heather. Her hubby's over here helping make straight lines with my husband. And this sweet lady here is learning how to plant tomatoes. So I'm gonna give the straight basics of how you put a tomato in the ground, how you space it, and how you'll start pruning it from day one. So we have dug these really, really nice deep holes here. I'm gonna say, depending on how nice the dirt is, it's about five, six inches deep, yeah. Because when you're planting a tomato seedling, you wanna put your stem about half, if not two thirds of your stem underground. And the reason for that is because these stems have little hairs on them, if you can see that, and all of those hairs, if they come in contact with the soil, will actually turn into roots that will grow horizontally, diagonally, and vertically down into the soil. So we wanna give this seedling the best start that we can by giving as much of the stem under the ground to start securing it into the ground to give it some foundation and also to start taking in as many nutrients as it can, obviously, so we can have a nice healthy plant that will produce some really nice big fruits. And the ones that we're putting in the ground right now are German Pinks. This is one of my all-star tomato varieties. These babies can get up to three pounds and they are a really tasty tomato variety. They're awesome for sauce or fresh eating. So these are like my prize winning tomatoes right here that Miss Streffling is about to put in the ground. Are you ready? <laughs> I am ready. <laughs> no pressure. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> when you're doing this, um, you now depending on the size of the plant, my plant is a lot smaller than hers. So my hole's not gonna be as deep and I can backfill in the dirt. And I'll show you what I mean here in a second if I have made too deep of a hole. So when you're doing this, you're just gonna tip over your cell. You're gonna squeeze lightly, which is, this is why solo cups are great because they're really flexible. And then, now in my case, I've got an extra seedling over here that I'm gonna very gently pull off and then I can plant that somewhere else. And then we're gonna set it right down into the hole. We're gonna push gently on top of that soil that you have, just push it gently down in there so we get the seedling as far down in the dirt as we can. Then use your hand if you're like me, or a spade if you don't want to get dirty. And you're going to start scraping that soil back around the stem. And you're going to kind of make sure that the stem of the tomato is as straight as possible. So as you're filling it in with one hand, hold it up straight with the other. Let me angle this camera a little better for you. Okay, so as I'm filling in, I'm also gently pressing down on the soil, again, with my hands or my spade, because if it's too loose, the minute that it rains or you water your plants, they're gonna move and shift. So you wanna make sure that it's not too compact, but nice and firm for that plant to start settling in. And I do tend to mound the dirt or the mulch around the top where the, um, the plant meets the soil because this will settle down and you don't wanna have a moat necessarily. So if there's a little bit of a mound there, Heather, we can do a little bit more here. Just push down and mound it up a little bit. Yep, we don't have to be too fussy. There we go. Now here's the other trick. If you look here at Heather's plant, beautifully placed. We have these lower branches here that we wanna just prick off with our fingers. So go ahead and grab that one, just prick it off. Because these are gonna sit here on this dirt and they're gonna just basically disease and mulch. And this is what the slugs will come after. So we're just gonna to toss those, compost them. And then here you have your beautiful little seedling. Woo. And as this grows, I will continue to um, prune off these bottom branches because they're gonna grow out to the side and they're gonna start touching the soil. So as that happens, I'll just prick them off. Now these are big tomatoes. So we're spacing these about 18 inches apart. We could actually go two feet apart, but because of the way I prune these, taking off most of the suckers, we're gonna go 18 inches. And that's to provide space and air between these plants because, if they're, because they're in the Solanaceae Solanaceae family is with potatoes and peppers. So they're prone to blight. So you wanna make sure you're giving them lots of room to breathe. Now, I will do a video on this later in the season, but I do tend to prune most of my suckers off tomatoes, but it also depends on the type of tomato it is and what it's producing. So for indeterminate tomatoes, which these are, which will continue to grow and grow and grow, I will prune most of the suckers off and especially if it's a plant that's gonna produce a nice big fruit, I wanna prune those suckers off 
so that the energy from this plant will go to producing really big hearty fruit. Now, if I'm doing a cherry tomato plant, that's a different story. Seedlings. But if you're looking at a plant like this, you have a main stem, right? You see that? Well, this isn't a good example because I've got two plants here. This one. This will work. You got a main stem and then you've got your branches. And a sucker is what grows right there between the branch and the stem. It comes out diagonally and basically what it does is it produces another stem that will produce more fruit. So it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're wanting a lot of fruit because the more suckers you have, the more places you'll have to grow fruit. Um, but that also means more energy is going into that sucker to produce fruit. So if you're wanting more of the energy to go to producing bigger fruits, mm -hmm. then you'll maybe want to prune off more of those suckers. If you're doing cherry tomatoes where you want lots of cherry tomatoes, then maybe you leave those suckers in, but your plant will go crazy. It'll go every which direction and sometimes it'll feel very unmanageable. So that's another reason why I prune off most of my suckers is just to keep the plant manageable and also to keep the space between them um, to where it's not too fussy and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, like full, you know? So that's that's sort of my theory in uh, sucker cutting, sucker trimming. Some people trim off all their suckers, some people leave them. I kind of going to go depending on how much space I have between the plants and what I'm trying to produce. Any other questions? Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes sense. Good. I'm glad that I have Heather here today because it, sometimes it's a good reminder for me that there are people that don't understand the nuances of something as, you know, that's probably good. Okay. Um, putting plants in the ground and why you would space them the way you would and why you prune them the way you do. So it's good to have, Newbie. good to have newbies here helping us out. As Heather and I chit chat here, topics come up that I probably should mention, you know, in case again, you're a newbie and these things don't cross your mind. But today it's, we have like a, just on and off sprinkles. It's very overcast, it's cooler weather. And to be truth be told, this is like the primo weather for transplanting. Because even though these plants have been hardened off all week long, and if you don't know what I mean by hardening off, I have a whole video on it, which I'll link right here. Um, but that's basically getting your plants acclimated to go outside because if they've been in your house for an extended amount of time, really more than a month, um, they're going to need a, a few days, if not a whole week, to start getting used to harsher weather outdoors, even just a breeze, direct sunlight, because your grow lights are generally never going to be as intense as the sun. Um, so anyway, if you are transplanting plants out, even if they've been hardening off, to have a nice cool day like this to get them into the ground is what you want. If it was really like beating down sun right now, not only would we be miserable, the plants would be miserable too. Um, so you would wanna make sure that they were really well watered before you put them in the ground. And you might just wanna wait till either the very end of the day when the sun is not as intense or be out really early and then give them a good water. Um, so if, you're, if you don't have the pleasure that we're having right now to plant in this type of weather, either aim for a cooler day or just do it in the early morning or late evenings. That's, there you are. That's good. To, I would have thought we'd want to be sunny. Yeah, but then I wouldn't have realized like how miserable it would be. Yeah, I always say plants are a lot like us. You know, if we're miserable and hot, they probably are too. <laughs> that's a good tip. You know, unless they're like a tropical plant. Right. You know, peppers kind of fall into that category. Um, they, they can handle the sweltering heat. But again, if they're not used to it, then that might be your exception. So Heather was asking which branches to cut off and how many to prune. And it reminded me that in general, you don't want to prune off more than 30% of the plant when you're pruning it because that can stress it out. So by a plant this small, by removing one or two branches, it's not gonna be a big deal. If I were to prune off this one and this one and this one, not only would that be kind of stressful, it wouldn't have enough leaves to really soak in the chlorophyll from the sun and do what it's supposed to do as a plant. So on this plant here, you could absolutely probably plant, pluck off this bottom leaf and I probably will later on this week, but for now we'll just leave it on and see yeah, what it does. Yeah, but honestly, 
this is a good amount. This top amount here is a good amount to leave. So I will very likely come and prune off this branch right here later this week. ask your question oh yeah so I was wondering about um, with the the suckers if they fit into the if they were part of that 30% don't prune more than 30% of your plant at, um, does that time. include suckers does that include suckers yeah Thank you. good question <laughs> I wouldn't have thought of it no not really no because basically what you're doing is you're giving energy back to the plant by taking that sucker away so yeah. if you're trying to stick to that 30% rule like when you're pruning your plants the sucker for the most part is not going to fall into that unless it's like you have your main stem and your sucker and that's it then maybe you consider that but what I was showing her was is we're moving into our cherry tomato plants now and cherry tomatoes are prolific when it comes to suckers and just branches in general and that's because they're producing a lot of fruit so this little guy has a sucker here a sucker here a sucker here yeah so cherry tomatoes just they have a lot more suckers than like your bigger tomato varieties so I mean really if you can catch them at this stage they're super easy to prick off um and later in the season i'll show you how you can turn a sucker a much bigger one usually you know more this size into another tomato plant because you can actually root those suckers in waters and they'll produce roots and you can turn them into a whole other plant cool same thing with basil um so anyway yeah so pruning his little guys out right now and i'll show you something else i just noticed on this plant is it's already got flower buds on it so right here at the very top, it's got its first set of flower buds, which of course the flowers turn into the fruit. Now you may be, you'll see this a lot with baby seedlings, like, oh, my first flowers, our first set of fruit. But on a plant this small, you really want to prune those off. Because again, you're wanting this seedling to work more on establishing its root system and getting a really strong root system and a really healthy plant. You really don't want it to start doing fruit until it's probably been in the ground a good couple of weeks and has a, a fair amount of growth on it, then you can really start letting it uh, produce its flower buds. So there's a hot tip for you. <laughs> it feels like symbolic of like, you don't want to just like throw like a baby into <laughs> to do something until this is it's true. mature and ready. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> like I symbolic of say life. gardening is always symbolic <laughs> of life. You know what I mean? So yes, absolutely. You don't. It doesn't need to be doing its mature job of producing fruit just yet. It's got to get its foundation in place. That is so true of life. All right. Turn that sucker off. Well, actually, that wasn't a sucker. It was just a branch. I was calling it a sucker. Sucker. <laughs> <laughs> That's my Oklahoma colloquialism coming in right there. Now. Does cantaloupe grow on the ground, too? It can. I mean, you, you can. Yes. It's a vining tra uh, plant, tra trailing plant that we're looking for. Uh, but you can obviously trellis it to grow up something. Oh, really? It seems like they'd be so heavy. It depends on the variety. So, um, have you ever grown cantaloupe? I have not successfully grown cantaloupe in Michigan, but yeah. that is because it's such a short growing season. And truthfully, I, that's kind of why I've been another great question. It's kind of uh, why I'm switching kind of the way I do some things. Cantaloupe watermelon cucumbers those plants really like warm ground mm -hmm. not especially to germinate but to, to get going so i could be planting them out like maybe a week ago but the ground is still really cooler than they like so they just get a really slow start especially if you direct seed them into the ground which is generally recommended um, and then we have a shorter season mm -hmm. so by the time they really get to where they are wanting to ripen the season's getting cool and they don't like that mm -hmm. All to say that I'm realizing to have success with those longer season plants that really needed a lot of that warmth, melons and cucumbers and some squashes, I have to start them indoors. Mm -hmm. So this year I started everything indoors and they, they're they about a three weeks old now. So when I plant them out, they'll have a really good head start. Does like, that make sense? Yeah. What, yeah. what are those? So melons? Uh, can't, I, just, I just did one, two cantaloupe varieties. And a couple of watermelon. I'm, I'm not doing a lot of them just because I don't necessarily have the space unless I do some more trellising. Um, okay, yeah. And that's her original question was how do cantaloupes grow? And cantaloupes and melons and cucumbers and winter squash, those will all grow 
on the ground. They'll all trail out, they'll fill out. You can absolutely grow those things on the ground. However, they can be a lot healthier if they're trellised because by growing them up and on something, you're getting them off the ground. So they have, they're you know, less prone to disease if they're off the ground. And they're getting a lot more air around their leaves because most cucurbits, which are melons, cucumbers, squash, all of those things, uh, they're prone to mildew. So you really wanna make sure their leaves get a lot of air around them, uh, especially when it starts getting humid outside. So trellising them on something, um, provides that and if they're a heavier fruit then you just have to cradle that fruit mm. with like pantyhose oh you know you put you put the fruit in pantyhose and then you tie it to the trellis and then that'll keep it secure until it's ripe Funny. yeah or yeah. some people use bras i'm not going to do that but some people do <laughs> <laughs> yes ma'am that would look hilarious nice. oh, it is you should see there's some funny pictures on face Can I do this? social media yeah. so landon do you think um I've seen, she's got it. She's got graph paper. She's got it laid out. She's got a plan. Um, but I'm just wondering if you would consider yourself more like very regimented or if you feel like you're just kind of winging it. If you come up with some sort of a plan or if you feel like compared to other gardeners, you're pretty... Um, Schedule then yeah. like what was like the first strict. word you used? What it? Use what word did you use? It was like perfect. I Regimented? Know. No. I know. It was like just pl just do I really plan everything out? Like yeah. how how thought out is everything? <clears throat> You're gonna like this answer. <laughs> <laughs> I am like very much both. I've always said I'm like a type. Um, I'm like a free spirit in a <laughs> firstborn's body. Oh yeah. So yeah. I have I have those tendencies to be, you know, um, very like organization and I like planning but I like the result of it I don't necessarily like doing it <laughs> so I don't necessarily like sitting down and like thinking out where everything's gonna go because I'm a free spirit at heart I like to be able to come out and just kind of I like winging it but at the same time because of, my, of what my goals are in the garden like mm. growing a lot of food mm -hmm. food that's gonna be feeding our family for months I can't really afford to be too haphazard and even though we have seven acres of property we can plant on, I don't have seven acres of fencing. So I've got to be able to, <laughs> I've got to be able to fit all of this in the, the space that we have. So that does take, that takes me having to do what is not always first nature, which is to sit down and plan it out mm -hmm. and know as much as possible where everything is going. So I, I've been in the past where I really just kind of go out and like, this sounds good. I'm gonna put this here. Like I have a really like, good idea how things grow and what they like. And I can do that on the fly. But again, with the situation that we're in now, trying to grow a lot of food for a big amount of family, for a big amount of family, for a big family, I have to be more thought out. So yeah. absolutely, there's definitely gardeners who are way more structured. Is that the word you use? Thank you. Plan probably way more than I do. But I have, in the last year specifically, um, I have become more of a planner. Now, what's funny about her question is, since I knew I had people coming out to help me today, I was like, I have to have a plan because I have to know where everything's going so I can tell them what we're doing. And I'm not sitting here staring at, you know, the dirt. If it was just me and my family, like I could swing that. Um, but I, I had to have everything figured out. And actually my husband is very much type A and he wants to know what day are we planning? What is going where? Tell me exactly what you want and I'll do it. So he kind of forces me to be yeah, that way. a good team. Yeah, we are a good team. So, so I like winging it, but at the same time, it's it's good. And I say that in a lot of my my workshops and a lot of my blog posts. Like it, it to do gardening really on any level, but especially on this level, you you do have to have a plan. So, does that answer your question? Yes. But if planning is going to keep you from getting in a garden, then don't let it. Like if you're a person that gets tied up thinking about a plan and you get like frozen because I've yeah. been that way like perfectionism yes absolutely don't let that keep you like just get out there and do it and yeah you may make some mistakes but that's to me like making mistakes are your best teacher and especially in the garden if you're willing to not be a perfectionist and let let you know nature have, have its way in a sense like you'll learn so much as a person and as a gardener and I just say don't let fear and planning keep you out of the garden but it definitely is helpful if you can learn to be a planner if you're not already right 
So I can swing to both ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah, because <laughs> I hear people, you know, talking about their garden planners, and oh, just yeah. to think about a garden planner is like, forget it. So garden <laughs> garden, garden planners are like my nemesis. <laughs> my sister-in-law was playing around with one, and she was having so much fun with it. She's telling me about it, and I was like, ugh. <laughs> Because I get too in the weeds with it. Yeah. I get too, like, um, I just get too in the weeds with it. And then it becomes frustrating. And then it's, like, so detailed. I don't know, like, what what's up from down. And, and that's kind of the same thing that can happen with companion planting. Like, if, if you start, when you start getting into companion planting, you can get so in the weeds of that. I know I'm <laughs> out of the camera intended. here, but I think you can do it. <laughs> yeah, pun intended. So, with companion planting, you can really get in the weeds with, what goes with what and what doesn't go with what. And I remember one time I had this map drawn out. Oh my goodness. I still have it. I still have the map. This is probably <laughs> like three years ago with everything with its perfect companion plant, everything next to it with its companion plant. And it was just, a, it was a doozy of a, of a plan. And it just, you know, if you enjoy that, go for it. But if it drives you insane, just make it simple. And that's kind of what I talk about in that my blog post on companion planting, like, Start with a few plants, the ones that maybe are your favorite and you, you want to do really well, or the plants that maybe haven't done the best for you in the past, and you want to find a companion that'll help, you know, either deter the pest that you're having problems with or encourage the growth, whatever it is, you know, start with a few plants and figure out their companions and then just take good notes. This is the other thing that I don't enjoy doing, but I've had to make myself do. And honestly, these videos that I make, these are my garden notes. <laughs> Yeah, I know you said for pesting. Yeah, I mean, like <laughs> just um, taking good notes of what happens each year, that's going to be your best friend in the garden because then you'll, your memory will not serve you well, even if you think it will. Um, so you'll want to write down, you know, this is what I did, this is how I did it, and this worked well and this didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so whether you're writing that down yeah, in, a, like a in a devoted, like a recipe, yeah. Whether you're writing it down in a devoted garden journal or just taking videos like this of yourself, reminding yourself how you have it planted, it'll be a lifesaver in the end. Um, it'll save you a lot of sanity. <laughs> you just right. do it on a Google Doc or notebook? Uh, I have a notebook. I'm more of a, a writey. Like, I like to have things like in paper. written form, yeah. paper, and, pen and paper. Yeah. Okay, I think we got to our two. Okay, we were laughing about this next tomato which is one of my favorite red cherry tomatoes. It's called a Mexico midget. That's what it's called. I didn't name it. This is from Seed Savers Exchange. If you have issues with it, take it up with them. Um, but this is a great cherry tomato, oh right? <laughs> Sorry, I love Seed Savers Exchange, so I kind of don't want you to take it up with them. They're a great company. They're, they're where I started with gardening, Seed Savers Exchange. Yeah, I mean, that's tons of awesome heirloom plants. They're an awesome company out of Iowa. So I kind of don't want you to take an issue up with them, right. but they could get you to the person that named it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're just yeah. Mexico midget. Sorry, but I think we're just talking about the fact that it's probably from Mexico, and you have their smaller red tomatoes. They're not a current cherry tomato, but they're a smaller red tomato variety. But they're great. I really like the flavor. Sweet. And you use them for salad. I mean, yeah, you can use them. Anything you use a cherry tomato for. I honestly, most of the time, it's just fresh eating for us. Mm. Um, but most of the time, they don't make it into the house. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Unless, you know, towards the end of the season when you're getting 10 jillion of them. Okay. We are moving on to peppers. Yep, yep. Now, for the tomatoes, we did a double row um, that will be trellised on a cattle panel. So I have cattle panels that will be going down the middle of the bed. And I have tomatoes on either side of that cattle panel that'll be trellised up. Um, when I place the cattle panels on the T-post, the base of the cattle panel will be two feet up. Reason being is once the once plants get about two feet tall, that's when they'll start falling over and they need to be trellised. Really up till then, they're fine just growing on their own. And the other part of that is cattle panels are five feet tall. So by lifting it two feet off the ground, I'm actually giving my plants a seven foot tall trellis. And um, while some of these cherry tomato plants can absolutely grow nine feet tall, I generally top them off, which means I cut the top of the plant so it'll stop growing towards the end of the season so it'll focus on ripening whatever fruit it has on the vine. But all of that to say, 
that um, I have the tomatoes growing um, on either side of a cattle panel. Now for the peppers, peppers can very easily grow closer together and giving them a square foot of space is perfectly fine. So I have a four foot wide bed. My beds are about 32 feet long, four foot wide. So we're gonna have rows of four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, all the way down. And I'm separating my sweet peppers from my spicy peppers, at least by a row, because they can be cross pollinated and the spicy pepper will always win. So if you have spicy peppers and sweet peppers planted next to together and you're trying to save seeds for the following year, which I do, you might end up with all spicy peppers if you have them planted too close together. So this will be my sweet peppers and I've got King of the Red, it's King of the Red, King of the North Red Bell Pepper, which has done really, really well for me the last, this will be the fourth year growing them. Clearly King of the North, they are meant to, they do really well in Northern climates. Really nice, big red bell pepper. And then I stole, not really, uh, a, I think it's called a Carmen, something Carmen red bell. I actually got this from a local farmer I met last year. Farmer Ed, I think is his name. Hello, Ed. We loved you. Um, he gave us some red bell pipers that tasted amazing. And so I actually saved those seeds and I'm growing them this year in my garden, which I'm really excited about. So I've got those. And then down the way, it's I think it's called an Escamillo yellow. So it's like a long yellow red or yellow bell pepper that is also sweet that I also got from Farmer Ed. That's what I used this past year to make my yellow pepper mustard butter. So down there, you've seen some yellow bell peppers, the Escamillo, I think is what it's called. And then just a bunch of like a mixture of mini bell peppers that I got from a seed swap with my sister-in-law. So let's get these spiced out. We're gonna have pepper mania all the way down. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Now with peppers, even though they're in the same family as tomatoes, they don't have the same growth habits in the sense that you have to plant the stem underground. Really, I could just put this part under the ground and it'll be fine because it's not gonna develop roots up here. Now I'll probably trim off these two bottom leaves because these are the cotyledon leaves, the first leaves that emerged and not the true leaves. But other than that, I'm only gonna have to dig a hole about three inches down. If more, I'll just backfill it, set it in and do the same process we've done with the tomatoes. But again, pepper plants do not need to be dug down as deep as tomatoes. Make sense? Yes. Alrighty. So, yeah, when do you start uh, your seeds? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> and with a great answer, it depends. So I had just told Heather that these pepper plants have been growing in my house since Valentine's Day. And now it's about, what would that be? March, April, three months later. Yeah. So pe plants like uh, peppers, herbs, some herbs, not all, but most herbs, um, and eggplant, take a, they take a while to get going. I mean, really like these pepper plants, are, they look fuller, but they're smaller than the tomato plants, which I started probably a month later. So they just they just take a while to get going, and that's why I have to start them a lot earlier yeah. inside. So, yeah, in February I was starting pretty much all my herbs, um, all my peppers, and all my eggplant. Tomatoes you can start about uh, four to six weeks before you plant them out, depending on how big you want them to get. I, if I had started my tomato plants in uh, the same time I started my peppers, they would have been out of control and, and toppling over okay. and like growing out of their cells. I mean, they were, my tomato plants were already looking uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> this past week. So they just, they just grow a lot quicker. And um, pretty, I mean, you can pretty much gauge your calendar off of any kind of growing calendar you can find online. Farmer's Almanac has a really great calendar it's pretty general mm. uh, I like botanical interests they have a sewing calendar for indoor outdoor um, herbs ornamentals and vegetables and so that's they have a really robust yeah. uh, sewing calendar which I really like but even then I don't always go by their calendar because I've kind of found in my own practice what really works when it works to start things and when it doesn't. So not everything. I don't like, there's still some things I, I still have to double check. Like when should I be starting this? But it just depends on the growth of the plant. Um, 
you can start a lot of your a lot of your plants you can start depending on the weather and what they enjoy um, three weeks before it's time to take them outdoors. It's long enough for them to germinate and get their first set of true leaves. So when a, when a plant germinates, the first leaves that come up, those are called like the cotyledon leaves. Um, they're, the, they're actually the seed that splits open and the leaf that comes up from that. Yeah. And then when they get their first set of true leaves, their first set of true leaves look different than the cotyledon leaves because this is actually a leaf of the plant. So you'll notice that even on these pepper plants they'll have these leaves right here at the base look totally different than the leaves up here and that's because these are the first set of leaves the cotyledon leaves and these are the true leaves anyway once they get their first set of true leaves depending on the weather outside you could actually move most of your seedlings outside oh, okay what plants could could you start now from seed that would that would go well or is it just too late no it's absolutely not too late it's ironic you asked that I wrote two blogs this week. One, a seed sowing calendar for May and a seed oh. sowing calendar for June. Oh, yay. For this area. Yeah, there's a <laughs> ton of stuff you can still start right now. Oh, good. You could start, um, you can start uh, summer squash, early variety winter squash, like if it, if it matures early enough for a shorter growing season. Again, this is for like Southwest Michigan, we're zone 6AB, right in that, right in that area. Um, you could start leeks, you could start beets, uh, beets for the root, beets for the leaves. You could start Swiss chard, kale, any kind of lettuces. You could start carrots. Um, I've even started tomato plants uh, one year this time because I didn't get a variety to germinate the way I wanted to. So I tried again and it still grew really well, even starting it in May. So, so yeah, there's actually quite a lot you can still start. And if you wanted to see the full list, I'll link the blog below but on pepperandpinegardendesign.com, go to my blog. There's a seed sowing calendar for May, seed sowing calendar for June, and I'll keep rolling those out as the summer moves on. Oh my goodness, that's really Yeah, it's helpful. really, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey. Where did all this mulch come from? Uh, wood chip drop. Oh, wow. So chipdrop.com. Oh. So tree, like arbors. Yeah. They're always looking for a place to dump their oh. wood chips. So someone was smart enough to come up with, hey, let's start a website where people can wow. request it. Yes. And they'll come drop it off at your property. So oh, yes. for free. Like for free. Yeah, you can wow. donate and maybe it'll help influence where they go. Oh. I I did one for free and one I did twenty bucks. Yeah. Um so like my free one down at the end of the driveway, we haven't utilized oh, it yeah. yet. And then this one, they dropped right here. And I was like, why did you do that? And I'm like, cause it's by the garden. <laughs> I, do you see how well we moved the one that's at the end of the oh, driveway? Yeah. <laughs> yep, still there. So, Wonderful. Yeah, it is. How often do you have to re redo this or recover it? Um, I probably will not have to recover it for this season unless I just need like just spotty areas, yeah. you know? Probably at the end of the season is when we'll dump more on here or cover uh, it with when we're every time we mow grass, we could throw grass in here as a mulch. Uh, or um, at the end of the season, we'll rake all the leaves and put the leaves in here. Oh wow! So I may, I may not even need another chip drop for carving the garden. What I may need it for is my compost. Oh uh, okay. Turning it into huh. compost. Okay. So and putting it in the chicken run. That's really where a lot of it needs to go now is in the chicken run uh, because they will make compost just uh, by putting. Yeah wood chips and things like that in there and it, they're yeah. scratching around with their manure it'll just underneath Get will just in turn into dirt. compost yeah okay so can you put anything in compost yes and no yeah i mean anything that's you wouldn't want to put like um so you can put these kind of animal manures in there because it's uh that's where i'm looking for vegetarian mm. they're all vegetarians mm. but you wouldn't want to put dog or cat manure in there because they uh, are not vegetarians okay. uh, so any kind of meat product or protein will end up fermenting and, and not produce what you want it to produce oh, so any kind of nature clipping you yeah. can put in there um, obviously food scraps cardboard paper as long as it doesn't have like colored inks in it what um, about coffee grounds? coffee grounds absolutely you get a starburst starburst starbucks Star and they have bags of coffee grounds oh. there for gardeners that want to come and oh for free you just yeah take it. yeah you huh. just take it they just they at least the most of them still do it where you can just walk in and they save their coffee grounds and put them in these big bags and you can just wow take them Ooh, yeah. I bet that would be great yeah mm -hmm. so 
The only thing about coffee is if they if it has heavy pesticide residue, mm. uh, that would be in the coffee ground. So uh, organic coffee though would be fine. Okay, yeah, I'm coming. Yep, here's the rain again. You look great. I yes. Got, I, I got work done today. We did. We've been out here since, what did we decide? Two o'clock? Two o'clock. And what time is it now? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Five hours. <laughs> Five hours straight. And that's why my hair looks like this because I've not gone inside to do anything. <laughs> Put makeup on, do my hair. This is real gardening, folks, right yes. here. So with the help of my sweet friend and our two husbands that scurried off the minute I turned the camera on, we got pretty much this entire garden planted. So we, I should have done a count, but before I turned the um, video on, maybe I'll count and then put it in the notes, but we got 32 feet plus of tomato plants put on with, on either side, tomato plants here. We've got sweet peppers all the way down there. Here we've got all of our spicy peppers going into our eggplant. And then I've got a hole there for a reason because down at the end, I've got zucchini and scallop squash. So I don't want those running into each other. And then over here, I had a surprise open bed. I guess I hadn't really fully completed my planning so that that answers Heather's question about like how meticulous That's am I? Not that meticulous. <laughs> so we had a whole bed left open. And so I'm actually turning that into my cucumber melon bed that will put a trellis in there to trellis them over. So that was kind of an exciting little surprise to have room for that. So what are your thoughts? What oh are you goodness. thinking from my today? My thoughts are, you guys, she is the real deal. <laughs> this woman is legit. Uh, I have been picking her brain all day with questions about seeds, starting seeds, planting, gardening. <laughs> I live in the city. Like, how can I do this in my little land barely any land she's she's got such a brain full of knowledge you guys listen to her and enjoy fire hose i tried to turn the fire hose off but apparently she's so not great. leaving overwhelmed so that's no, good no. that's good so it was fun it was fun i will tell you that gardening with friends is the way to go now sometimes it's nice to be in the garden and have your solstice but having someone here to just laugh about life and funny things that happen. We have a lot about of bloopers. Talk about homeschooling. <laughs> Fell off the log a couple times. We had some fun bloopers Cat in there. Knocked over the cats knocked over cats. <laughs> cats knocked over the camera. All kinds of fun stuff. So if you have a buddy or make a buddy, invite people over and bring them into your gardening space. And um, especially someone that's wanting to learn. You know, if you have knowledge, pass it on. That's how we learn. And uh, we were talking about just getting started. Just just get started and you'll make some mistakes. You'll have some losses, but turn those into wins. And the next year it'll do better. And the next year it'll do better. And yep. yeah, so this I'm was excited. exciting. I'm so excited for this. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give it a good water. And we're gonna go inside and have a Sabbath dinner together. Woo! But we are gonna wash our hands first. So. <laughs> so you guys, thanks for joining us. If you stayed in this long, thanks. It's been a fun day. This is like the time of the year that I wait for to get all this on the ground and then get to growing and harvesting. So more videos will be coming. I still have to plant the corn a uh, winter squash patch, which that'll be an interesting adventure to bring you along with. Um, still got to put all these trellises up and we still have beans to plant and more seeds to sow, if you can believe it. Mm -hmm. So more content on the way. As always, my name is Landon Gilfillan here with Pepper and Pine Garden Design. Growing gardeners, growing gardeners and their gardens. <laughs> see, it's been a long day. So we will see you in the next videos. Thanks for tuning in. All right.